in Kansas City, a black teenager was shot after he accidentally knocked on the wrong door. Andrew Lester, a white man in his mid-80s, has been arrested. And his grandson now says his grandfather was consumed by racist conspiracy theories that he absorbed by keeping his television on 24 hours a day. His grandson is blaming the police for not acting sooner. Acting sooner by doing what? Disconnecting Fox News? I'm pretty sure Fox News doesn't fall into the category of red flag laws. It should, but it doesn't. But this is what Fox News does to old people. It makes them shoot unarmed black teenagers. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. You happy, self-actualized hump. Well, after 10 years with Fox News, Dan Bongino has been fired. Oh, too bad. Dan said he plans to write a book and pick up extra cash by doing some freelance racism on the side. Tough Tough time for Dan Bongino. First, uh, he lost his radio show and today his television show. Plus, he put a lot of his money into Parler, the right wing social media company, which was temporarily shut down. Poor guy has money problems. Forget owning the libs. Dan Bongino can't even rent one. In case you're unfamiliar, Dan Bongino was a New York City cop before joining Fox News 10 years ago and... Being a New York City cop, fully trained Dan for Fox News, since most of his time at Fox was spent beating up on innocent black people and ignoring women who have just been raped in the office because it was run by Roger Ailes. Well, Dan, if it makes you feel any better, you're getting fired. Does prove you're right about one thing. Immigrants are taking jobs away from Americans Because as we all know, Rupert Murdoch was born in Australia. There's a shining example, Rupert Murdoch, of why we need to close the border. Rupert Murdoch is right about the immigrants. We need to close the border. Dan Bongino, this is true. He's losing his show on Fox News. And it was called, and I'm not making this up, it was called Canceled in the USA. That was his show on Fox News, Canceled in the USA, where Dan takes on America's cancel culture. Canceled in the USA will be replaced by a new show called Irony in America. Yeah, the cancel culture hit Fox News and they canceled Don Bongino. Uh, Fox News, rough week. Uh, On Tuesday, Fox agreed to settle that defamation lawsuit filed by Dominion for nearly three quarters of a billion dollars. Fox News had a part with three quarters of a billion dollars. That's nothing to sneeze at, since it's probably unvaccinated. You don't want to sneeze at three quarters of a billion that's unvaccinated. It it could get very sick and die before you can deposit it safely into your own account. So Dominion, if you're watching, do not sneeze at Fox News's money. It's unvaccinated. Three quarters of a billion dollars. Give you an idea of what three quarters of a billion dollars can get you. That's six female staffers agreeing not to press charges against Bill O'Reilly. That's uh, Bill O'Reilly with the founder of Fox News, Roger Ailes, who sexually harassed, abused and raped the women on Fox News. In other words, Roger Ailes was a Republican And Bill O'Reilly was Me Too'd out of there. I don't know if you remember. It was just one multi-million dollar settlement after another with Bill O'Reilly, which for a while Fox News chalked up to the cost of doing business with him. The same way they look at this settlement with Dominion. You got to spend money to make money. Fox News is a lie machine. And that three quarters of a billion dollar settlement is the grease that keeps it moving. You know, I don't know if they should have settled. I think Fox News could have beat Dominion in that trial. All they needed was to win over 12 individuals who already fit Fox News's core demographic. 
people too stupid to get out of jury duty. But uh, there will be some cutbacks to pay for that settlement. Tucker Carlson was told from now on, Fox can only afford to persecute the L and the G. A little B, but there's no longer anything budgeted for the T and the Q. More cutbacks. Coffee in the Fox News break room now costs a dollar, but the pigment reduction supplements in the medicine cabinet will remain free of charge. This is the largest defamation settlement in American history. But Dominion says it didn't get what it really wanted, and what it really wanted was an apology. Sure, that's what they really wanted, an apology. It sounds like every divorce, doesn't it? You know, the the five houses, the cars, the cash, the Picassos and the jewelry. They're really nothing because what I really wanted was an apology. No, what you really wanted was just the five houses, the cars, the cash, the Picassos and the jewelry. Well, Dominion isn't done. They're also going to be suing Rudy Giuliani and the My Pillow guy for everything they are worth, which amounts to, I don't know, what's the silver in your back molars going for these days? They're broke. Uh, I don't know what Mike Lindell is stuffing in his mattresses, but I can assure you it isn't cash. Life's been tough on Mike Lindell ever since he got addicted to fame. He should go back to crack. It's much healthier, and you surround yourself with a much better class of people. And Rudy, well, Rudy has no money. Yesterday, he booked a press conference at Four Seasons Total Landscaping to announce he'll do your lawn for a pint of Jim Beam. Remember when Trump told Rudy to dig up the dirt on Hunter Biden? Now Trump is ordering Rudy to dig up the dirt clogging Mar-a-Lago's sewer drain. This morning, Rudy went down to the plasma center to make 70 bucks. The nurse came back five minutes later and said the test results are back and your blood alcohol level is 0.914. Rudy said, fine, I'll drink it here. Rudy has been suspended from the D.C. bar for not paying his dues, but Rudy told the D.C. bar that Phil informed him he had an open tab. Three quarters of a billion dollars. Granted, Fox News makes billions, but trust me, Fox is still hurting. Black people, Mexicans, Guatemalans, and drag queens. Well, Dan, if it makes you feel any better, you're getting fired. Does prove you're right about one thing. Immigrants are taking jobs away from Americans Because as we all know, Rupert Murdoch was born in Australia, is suing Fox News for $2.7 billion. In case you're not aware, Smartmatic is a multinational voting machine company headquartered in London. In other words, you must be an American citizen to run for president, but not to count the votes. Sorry, there's an opening at Fox News. Uh, Dan Bongino's gone, and I figured if I clipped that one and send it over to Fox, maybe they would hire me. Well, meanwhile, on Fox News all week, there has been absolutely no mention of the Dominion lawsuit. If you watch Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, or Laura Ingram, you'd have no idea that Dominion won their case or that Lincoln freed the slaves. The good news is that Fox has learned its lesson, and from now on will only exhibit the highest standards of journalistic ethics. For example, here's Maria Bartiroma yesterday. So the bottom line is uh, COVID-19 came from a lab. It was manufactured in a lab. Uh, It was funded with U.S. dollars. There was nobody in the United States to investigate that lab. And here we are. You're back. Maria's back, baby. I remember Maria Bartiroma on CNBC when she was just stupid. All right, so I have a note here. Do not fawn over this guest. Keep it cool. I'm going to keep it cool. I've been trying to get Mike Elk on the show for a couple of years. Mike Elk If you don't know who he is, uh, then uh, you should know 
Mike Elk and Payday Report. He is a hero. He really is. Uh, he was instrumental in Politico unionizing the newsroom. And Politico pulled a Howard Schultz and a Jeff Bezos. And I guess they fired Mike for trying to unionize Politico. He got a settlement from Politico. And Mike Elk did what Ralph Nader did when Ralph got a settlement from General Motors. He said, I could use this money for good. And he used the settlement money to found Payday Report, which is the single most important labor website in America. Its strike map is phenomenal. And Mike Elk, it is an honor to, to have you on the show. Thank you. Did I get that right? Did I get, I, I, which part of it? My, you're being my hero. Did I get that right? Uh, were, no, no, were, no, that's were, terrible. Were you fired like, like by Politico? From, were you fired? I, I was. Yes, what happened was at Politico? Fired. I, I was the head of the union. It was about eight years ago. Um, we were trying to organize, and I was illegally fired. I won two and a half years' salaries of settlement. Big thanks to the European Federation of Journalists because Politico was trying to expand in Europe at the time, and European Federation of Journalists put a lot of pressure on them. And you know, we took the money, and we invested in a buddy of mine, a guy who helped get a settlement. Um, you know, I'm on the autism spectrum, and uh, this guy you're on I the what get spectrum? A, a, the autism spectrum. Oh, okay. So this guy had helped get a settlement. Um, you know, he uh, comes around, and you know, says, "Hey, look, you know, you helped me get the settlement." You know, you should really think about setting up your own thing and maybe trying to do this Patreon thing, which I don't recommend anyone does Patreon. They take, you know, 10, 13 percent cut off of folks. It's, it's mm -hmm. outrageous. I mean, we use PayPal, which is predatory, and they take almost three. Uh, but Patreon uh, is really bad. Um, and, you know, they're sort of selling people on the idea of, um, you know, uh, you have to get into this. Anyhow, we started this publication. Uh, we raised money. Our first year in business, we raised about 50000 in about nine months. Uh, and we just kept going. Uh, and we've, you know, we, we call ourselves, you know, we focus on labor and news deserts. But at this point, you know, I, I, I look at things, you know, pretty intersectionally. And, and I think, you know, I, I really consider myself a labor and racial justice reporter at this point. I see. Right. And you I mean, if you, if you look at these numbers this past year, right, union growth in this country in this past year um, is 100% accounted for from workers of color. White people lost 300,000, um, not 30,000 union members, whereas people of color gained 260,000, right? So, I mean, we, we're talking a lot about Starbucks and all these things, which is important. It gets a lot of people interested. Uh, it's radicalizing a lot of people. It's, it's mobilizing a lot of people. It's teaching people. But actually, the areas of growth we're seeing right now in the U.S., are primarily in state and local governments in the South and Democratic municipalities where people are getting collective bargaining rights in places like Virginia, where they just, um, you know, grant a collective bargaining rights to, uh, um, you know, public employees. That's where we're seeing the growth. And at this era, when we're talking about socialism, right, I think this would be all the more argument of why we need to expand the public sector, right? Um you know, we talk constantly in the labor movement about the difficulty of organizing the private sector, and it should be made easier. But right now, we're seeing explosive growth at universities. You're seeing strikes at Rutgers, Michigan. Um, I can't. I, I lose track of them. There's well, so many of them. Well, you have a, which you is why we had to start a map and a right. newsletter to put this stuff in. Right. Right. Uh, so, you know, there's just so much going on right now um, that it's really incredible. And we don't quite have the labor press we need to be able to do it at, you know. Um, and, and, you know, I think often something that frustrates me, particularly, you know, I grew up in a big union family. I'm, you know, it's actually our, our thousandth article celebration. We published our right. thousandth article in seven years. So I'm ducking into someone's car right now. Right. Thank you. And thank you for I know. I know this is a big no, I feel thank bad you. about double booking. I felt really no. bad about it. Uh, um. You're, we're losing your connection there. And, but part of it was, you know, we just, hello? Yeah, we're, we're, we're catching up. It's, okay, oh. so you, we're having a, a connection problem. So you were saying 
that you you are celebrating your 1,000th article that has been published in seven years. In yeah. seven years. You have a staff, and I get emails from small, you. Small staff, yeah, small, part-timers. And journalists. They like to have full-timers. Right. What, what, so uh, seven years, what is your dream? What, what would you like to see Payday Report grow into? I like to see Payday Report grow into the kind of publication that covers the Pittsburgh Pirates winning the World Series. But, <laughs> uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, that requires the Pirates to first win the World Series. Uh -huh. right? So, I mean, that's my dream, but. Uh, you know, I think I'd like to see us, um, you know, become a, a publication, maybe four or five people, get some people in the door, but part of a larger, larger ecosystem. Uh, you know, we've been working a lot with the uh, O'Valley, the Ohio Valley Hauler, as um, which is one of our affiliate bureaus in Wheeling, as well as with uh, Portas Favelas and Rio de Janeiro. We're about to announce some big news on that. You were just down and, in Brazil yeah, covering Lula. Yeah. Yeah, I went to journalism school there, and I worked at the BBC there uh, back in the day, back during Lula's re-election, 2006, 2007. And, um, yeah, I went down there. I stayed with my old host family from when I was in university, and I went down there. Uh, you know, I was down there for three seconds. Okay, oh, hang on for one second. I, 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 there's some things that you've, some bombs you've dropped, and I, I, I have to. So you went to journalism school in Brazil. Yeah, at Pukie Hill. I actually attended journalism school with Marielle Franco. Marielle was um, a Rio City Councilwoman, a black woman, socialist, who was assassinated, actually, by paramilitary gangs linked to Bolsonaro. But yeah, that era of, of where I went to school, I mean, especially during Lula's first term, those folks were pretty militant. Well, how did you and end up? Hang on for one second. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but <laughs> do you speak Portuguese? I speak Portuguese. I speak Portuguese. You grew up in Pittsburgh. You speak. Well, I learned it here when I when I was sixteen. I mean, my dad was a union leader, right uh, next neighbor to over, actually at a, a, a Westinghouse plant, um, old Westinghouse um, switch and signal plant. Uh, it was pretty mixed race, UE, uh, not electrical workers. And um, you know, I remember, you know, I grew up in a family where my grandparents, when I was fourteen, got me a subscription to the Nation. Mm -hmm. You know. Where, you know, I had these Jewish communist grandparents and if, you know, if it was Sunday dinner, you were expected to know what was in the nation because everybody was talking about it. Right. right. But why? Uh, but, but, what, how did you end these... up? But how did you like how did you pick Brazil? Well, well, this is what I was going to say is that when Lula won in 2002, it was so exciting for the left. There were all kind of articles in the nation and elsewhere. I mean, he was a left alternative to Bush at the time in the Americas. Right. And he was a trade union leader who had led these strikes to bring down the dictatorship in the 70s and the 80s. He led these strikes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was very interested in that. And then you had uh, the World Social Forum it used to be down there at Porto Alegre in Brazil, in the early 2000s. You had the Landless Workers Movement, the Landless Workers Movement. It's a group that goes out into farmland under the 1988 Brazilian Constitution. They had a military dictatorship until then. If you can find that farmlands being just held to be held to be speculative and not being used for anything. You know, in the 80s, they had huge hunger issues uh, in Brazil in the 80s. And so they said, if you can go out and find farmland that's being just owned to just sit on and not being used to produce food, and you're in an area with hunger issues, you can go out and claim that farmland and we'll give you the deed to it. You know, you have to pay a certain price and we'll, you know, we'll give you a mortgage. We'll set up a system to do that. And so 300,000 families in Brazil have gotten the right to farmland that way. The largest supplier of organic rice in Latin America is the landless workers who've been key cogs for Lula. I mean, when Lula was in jail, um, Lula was in jail um, for two years, falsely accused of some bribery scheme. Um, the landless workers movement maintained a vigil outside his jail cell um, around the clock where every morning people would wake up and they would sing, good morning, Mr. President. <laughs> Uh -huh. Good afternoon, Mr. President. And people would call in about organizing problems and he would write letters out. And he said the two years he was in jail, knowing that there were all these activists stopping by and shouting and organizing problems. You know, people would shout and, oh, you know, we're dealing with this issue. And he'd write out a letter. You have to think about that. You know, think about this. Um, and he, his wife, Janja, um, you know, Lula's first wife for 50 years, Lula's 77 had a stroke when he was first convicted 
and died. Uh, his grandson died while he was in jail, and he couldn't be with his grandson. Um, and Lula's first wife died, and he started writing and meeting with this woman, Janja, who's a sociology professor. Uh, and they met while he was in jail. And so, you know, when Lula got out of jail, I mean, you know, it was just, you know, for the left in Brazil, that was vindication. It was time to take on the right. It was time to take on Bolsonaro. Um, and it's important to bring up about Lula. When he was president of Brazil, in Brazil, public universities are free. If you can get in, which 20 percent of the population can do more or less. You know, it's not uh, I'm off on those numbers, but it's not a huge chunk of the population. And um Lula doubled the number of public universities. He implemented affirmative action. He raised the minimum wage by 70%. He started offering financial benefits to families if their kids stayed in school through high school. So you have a whole generation of very educated Brazilians who've rapidly transformed their material wealth. I mean, he cut poverty in half in that country in eight years, who really see him as a leader, as a Mandela-like figure. And so when he won and he was out, and I, you know, I was with the president, I was with President Lula, in San Bernardo dos Campos, uh, his neighborhood, um, where in the 80s and the 70s, he helped lead uh, wildcat strikes at General Motors that helped bring down the dictatorship. I was out there with all the folks he'd grown up around out there in those years. And they were hugging him and they were congratulating him. And it just felt like, I don't even know how to describe it. I, I, I try to find the words to describe it. But, um, you know, when Lula won, I was with my old host family and I was in Rio de Janeiro. I was kind of in a bougie neighborhood. Think Santa Monica, mm -hmm. you know, think Manhattan. Um, and people went to the windows. My host father called me, my old host father. I was there 15 years ago, went to the window and he said, Mike, you need to listen to what's going on here. Cause people were at their windows shouting Lula, just right. screaming into the night. Uh, and then they had a party there that went four in the morning in Rio. I mean, they had these big carnival sound trucks, right? coming out people on top of these sound trucks uh singing and dancing and the thing to remember about brazilians that, that's important to bring up um and i you know is that this is a generation that you know folks your age folks my parents age defeated a dictatorship so the memories of that kind of militancy among people our age i would say brazilians of my age were much more tuned in politically and they're also very tuned into what was happening here with Bernie. I mean, I went to journalism school there 2006, 2007, and it was embarrassing to say you're an American, um, you know, with Bush there. But this time around, everybody was asking me about, oh, man, how'd you guys beat Trump? You know, and I felt a lot more pride and thinking about, you know, because I think so often when we think about coverage of Brazil, we think about it. Uh, the people that do write it are very rich. They're very white. I mean, learning a foreign language is a hard thing. I started when I was 16 and just stayed at it. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to travel a lot. And I had a scholarship program and I was able to do that. Uh, I was lucky uh, coming from a blue collar family. Most people don't have that kind of luck in their lives. And so, you know, being able to go down there and, and be in that kind of environment and see a country that's changing is just amazing. Right. Well, how is he holding up? Because Bolsonaro is back in Brazil? Has Bolsonaro arrived in Brazil? Are they going to put him on trial? Are they? Well, he, he Bolsonaro did this like three months sort of weird exile in, in Florida where he, he hung out at a KFC mm -hmm. in Orlando, which is pretty wild to think about. You know, you, you, you loot a country, you kill a bunch of people, and then you hang out at a KFC in Orlando. Doesn't seem worth suburb. it to me. <laughs> Doesn't seem it at all. At least go to I mean, Applebee's. At least enjoy. Well, I mean, I, mean, I know a million rednecks that hang out at KFC and they never had to murder anybody. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So, so how big a I threat? I don't say redneck. Hmm? How, 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 what is the origin of the word redneck? It comes from guys wearing red bandanas around their, 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 their necks to symbolize uh, that. Uh, they were leftists during the West Virginia mine wars. So right. you know, I had a lot of family who grew up. <laughs> I, I didn't offend anyone saying that. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people think redneck is making fun of uh, men and women who work the fields and their necks are red from the sun. But it's the uh, the strike it was uh, in Arizona. Uh, I'm trying to remember the town. It's where Doug Stanhope lives. And I can't remember the, the, the town. So. Learning, going to journalism school in Brazil, 
what is their f they don't have a First Amendment, but what are their freedom of speech laws and what what can you get away with in Brazil that you, you can you can, you can get away with a lot, but you could also get killed, as many journalists did, including my colleague Dom Phillips from when I worked at The Guardian. Um, what happened? You know, um, he was up in the Amazon. He was investigating legal poaching in an indigenous area that was reserved and him and, and uh, a top indigenous official were both slaughtered and killed. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, the freedom of speech. You look, I'm not an expert. I mean, there's a lot of that. I mean, <laughs> we went down there and did a lot of that. But there's a lot of violent retaliation. Uh, and it's something. Is that discussed that in an, the journalism school? Yes, 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 yes. In what way? Uh, I mean, it's it's hard sometimes to discuss. Um but we were trained what to do if we were picked up by the military police. The military police are, are, are still a big police force there. Um, I mean, I was strip searched by them. I, I was 21. Um, there were operations. I got caught in a neighborhood where there was a huge gun battle between the cops and these drug lords. And so, yes, we, we talked about safety and we talked about uh, what to do. Um, and I always knew as an American, you know, that my life was pretty safe. Do you, you still, American, I mean, do you still do you, do you think this country, our freedoms are going to go the way of Brazil? Is it is it getting harder for reporters here? It could change. I, I mean, it's scary. I mean, you know, I look at the death threats I get in the last couple of years. It's pretty scary. You get death threats. Yeah, occasionally, yes. Because you're supporting the workers in this country. Well, I mean, when I talk about black folks and Jewish folks, I'm Jewish. And yes, we get death threats. And then occasionally I've written about men who've uh, abused women. And, and one time, one of those guys threatened to kill me. I mean, but that's that was in the labor Jew movement, right? That you exposed. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it was a this guy, Michael Foucault. He was the Harvey Weinstein of Pittsburgh. Um, sorry. The the lights of oh, sorry, I have it there. We're, um, we're talking with Mike Elk. He is the founder and chief editor over Payday Report. I'm going to ask my listeners uh, to donate to Payday Report. I don't believe you have any advertising. Is that correct? No, 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 no. You're completely um, supported by your readers. And, yeah, and some freelance work. And sometimes we get a small grant, maybe thousand, two thousand dollars from a group or something like that. Right. There, but I mean, we we have a small publication. So anybody who wants to donate, they can go to paydayreport.com. It's our thousand article celebration. We're trying to uh, raise a thousand dollars. Right. And uh, let me ask you about your long COVID. One, one of the things I love about oh. you is that you give updates on your health because unions are about taking care of workers. And there is a story to payday report that you report on how you're feeling, how your health is, what you're trying to raise for your staff. And uh, it's almost a class in, if you subscribe to your newsletter, it's almost a class in running a a, a news organization that that puts people first. You We're do, trying to run a news organization. But you do. I, re, I remember getting emails that you needed to make pay, a payroll for your staff and how hard it is. What are the challenges to to run a a, 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 a I'm going to say a news organization fairly? And that I mean, you're going to be held to a higher standard because <laughs> you're covering labor. <laughs> So the last thing you need to be called is a hypocrite. So what are the challenges of being a boss who hires people to cover uh, the abuse of workers? Well, we pay everyone 32 an hour, commiserate. Uh, sometimes there's some labor swaps. Uh, we have a few people who volunteer very part time. How do you arrive at $32 an hour? <laughs> well, we were found in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, I'd covered the Volkswagen Union Drive there. This was nearly a that decade failed. ago. That failed, right? That failed nearly, yeah. And I covered it and moved back down there to write about and hang out with some of my buddies. I was dating someone down there at the time. 
and <laughs> the mechanics in Volkswagen were making 23 and the folks over in Germany were making 32. So I said, well, we ought to pay someone who's as skilled as a mechanic $32 an hour. But also because, you know, it led to people that, you know, if you're hiring people very part-time, you know, for an editor, you might only need an editor a couple hours a week. You, you want them to know that when you work for me, you're going to be well compensated, right? It's going right. to be sporadic work. It's going to be an honor system. I'm not going to nickel and dime you, you know? Um, and, and that's been, that's been a challenge. And, you know, Look, I've gotten a lot of trouble in my career at Jacobin, uh, as elsewhere. You know, Jacobin, right, uh, they really don't pay their writers well at all. I've written about it. They've been accused of wage theft. Um, I haven't written about them in several years, so I don't know what they're paying now. They might be doing much better. I hope they are. But five years ago, they were you know, paying people $100 an article, right? Um, so I hope they're doing better now, uh, I, you know. And so, you know, I've caught out a number of publications on that. And, and that's tough. Um but, you know, I think, um, look, I'm 37. I came of age during the anti-war in Iraq movement in the early 2000s, which fed off of the WT, WTO movement, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, the battle in Seattle, which, you know, we watched live with my dad on C-SPAN. You know, pre-social media, pre-Facebook, pre, um, you know, Twitter, Instagram, the only way to really interact with folks was through um you know, those kind of blogs. Right. It was the golden age of blogs that era. Mm -hmm. You know, I really was. And I was in college at that time. And when I went down to Brazil, those folks were really deep into it on another level, particularly in some of these poor slums, uh, these favelas where I was. And I'll never forget, I had this professor in journalism school in Brazil who had fought the dictatorship. And he said, Truly good journalism is community therapy. It's how people work out their issues in a community. You do that in your emails. I try to. You really, I, I know more about you than I know uh, about some family members. How is your long, you have long COVID, don't you? Yeah. Well, well that's been hard. It's a neurological, a lot of chunks of it is neurological. I have to nap a lot. Um, um and, you know, I put on, I got COVID uh, after my booster shot and I couldn't work for almost two months. And then I had right. brain fog for months. It was terrible. And there's not much financial assistance out there. Uh, if anybody who's listening knows of good ways to get them, let me know. Right. Um, and my, our readers have had to carry us. And it's been hard because some days, you know, it's really related to ME and overexertion issues. Because, you know, I put on 20. 25, 30 pounds since I got sick a year and a half ago. And I, I keep trying to work out and then I'll work out a bit and then I can hardly move for a day or two. Right. And how do you. I, and, and it's hard. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a neurological thing. It's from what we're, we're knowing about. And that's um, and we don't know enough about it at all. And we're, we're looking at right now, the statistics show that seven to eight percent of Americans have long COVID. And I don't think the Biden administration wants to talk about it because it makes them look like failures. Right. And I've always believed, you know, it goes back to the idea of community therapy, that um, people uh, should talk about their issues. They need to. They need to understand What do you themselves. think of your new senator? I don't have a good opinion. Really? But I, uh, because I don't. I, uh, you would know more about this than I do. He's not using... Well, these... he wanted to frack in my parents' watershed. Oh. And, you know, he was MIA for summer relief for years. I think what he did on disability on depression was very bold and I'm very supportive. That's very hard for any senator. He could have lied. He could have claimed other things. I thought it was very bold and very good. And I think he has a lot of good intentions and I hope folks hold him accountable, but he's not the burning progressive that someone like Summer Lee, you know, I went to high school with Summer Lee, uh, is. Um, but I think he's been pushed by people like Summer. And I think Summer's open that space. I mean, look, I, I met Summer when I was 15 years old. Uh, she was a, she was a track star, and then she was later the drum major at my high school. We were winning Western Pennsylvania football championships, and and Summer's bold. Summer has a lot of confidence that that is deep inside of her. Right. You know, she's a great family, good folks. You know, right? New congresswoman and your new governor, Josh Shapiro. Do you, is he too much like he Obama, seems, or is he? I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't have a deep opinion yet. Um, right. Before and, you and go, I say that I say that as a journalist because I think too often journalists' opinion on things they don't know a lot about, 
Uh, right. And I don't quite know enough about him yet. I know he's gotten criticism from various sides. Uh, we'll see. OK. Uh, before you go, who are your heroes working today, uh, alive today? Like or doing like Bernie, who who's out there doing stuff that you say these are these are great men? Well, I mean, one of my biggest heroes is Clarissa Leon, you know, who was our editor for many years, is now the deputy editor of Document at NY in New York. Um, you know, I look up to John Nichols of the nation tremendously. I think he's kept the soul of this movement uh, alive in so many of his writings about the left and, and how things have transpired and how things have carried on. Um, who else are my heroes that, that are alive? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't, I don't think... Often here, I mean, obviously, Summer Lee is one of mine. I mean, I grew up with her and, you know, to finally feel, you know, represented in Congress uh, and to see someone who I've known since high school and that few people more than Summer. Um, obviously, you know, Lula is a big hero. Right. Right. Michael uh, Brooks. I said, I said Did you know Michael Brooks? Lula, I, I didn't know him. Um, we were in similar friend circles, but yeah. it was bold what he did. And I thought it was important how he focused attention yeah. on that in that time. What is your reading diet? What do you have to read each day? Uh, the first thing I like to read is the Pirates Roto World sum, sum up. And then, and then I read rumbunter.com, which is about the Pittsburgh Pirates. So I typically start off the day reading about the Pirates. Oh, my other hero, Andrew McCutcheon, coming back to Pittsburgh. Um, you know, I do some baseball writing, and I don't think a lot of people realize this about me. Uh, you know, I have a season pass to go all season to the ballpark here in Pittsburgh. And I catch about 40 games a year. And I write about politics and the culture and, and the working conditions in the ballpark. And, you know, I think it's really important in the movement. We can push ourselves to work so hard all the time, right? And there's a lot of vicarious trauma. We're always trying to help people, help people that are hurt. And you need to have the bread and roses approach. What are our roses? And for me, it's been baseball. Uh, so, you know, obviously, if I had to name any biggest of my heroes, it would be Roberto Clemente. Uh, and maybe that's a good note to end on, which is Roberto Clemente, um, you know, was the first Latino baseball superstar. Um, he played here for the Pirates from 1955 to 1972. He was the first Latino to ever have 3,000 hits, and he was black. And he died on a plane flight that was labeled as humanitarian to Nicaragua in 1972 to inspect how the Somoza dictatorship was stealing goods. And... Um, the thing I've written about a lot that people don't get is that Clemente was actually a huge activist. Martin Luther King used to stay on his farm in Puerto Rico. Clemente was the first players rep for the National League for the Union. Clemente called the first players strike when, assassin when Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, Clemente, when he was going down to Nicaragua, had been very critical of U.S. imperialism in Latin America and was going there as the most famous Latino ball player to get a real report on what CIA allies of the American, uh, you, know, dic you know, imperialists were doing down there. The Samosas were big allies of the CIA. They were brutal dictators. And, you know, he, there's no conspiracy theory. I mean, he died because it was a bad plane. It was overloaded. Uh, it crashed on takeoff. But, you know, Clemente uh, in this town, you know, we're taught as kids, as young kids growing up playing baseball, to think about Clemente. You know, there's Clemente Day here in Pittsburgh. There's murals everywhere. We have Roberto Clemente Bridge, which goes to the ballpark. We have a Clemente Museum, which is, has its own winery. Uh, so, you know, every sports bar here has a photo of Clemente. So if I could ever meet one of my heroes who was dead, I would want to meet Clemente. Fantastic. And I want to know what him and Martin Luther King talked about when they would hang out in Puerto Rico on the Why farm. Write a play. Ah, that would be great. <laughs> that would be a great play for you. to. Uh, it would. Your writing discipline uh, is... How do you know when to stop writing? To when it's done. <laughs> okay. Well. I mean, I consider myself like a line cook. I'll write like 120, 150 stories a year. Amazing. Just got to do it. Yeah. Just got to get it out there. Hey, thank you for doing this, Mike Elk. Thanks so much. And sorry for the bad lighting. No, no. I'm I'm, look, I know what you're going through. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what. I don't even know what I'm going through, but I know the pressures you're under and it's an no, honor. No, it was the same night of our party. I feel bad. Well, go to your party. Mike Elk, Payday and please report. please donate, paidreport.com. Believe me, I'm going to harangue them once you go. So thank <laughs> Thanks you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mike Elk. I hope to see you soon. It's, it's, that is Mike Elk. And uh, 
So if you have any money, I'm talking to my listeners, if you have any money, and I'm, you know, five dollars, a dollar, uh, you cannot spend your money any better than giving to Payday Report. Go to Payday Report. This is truly a great man. Please welcome Professor Mike Steinell. And we're running on time today. Are we really? Yeah. Did I keep you waiting? Or, or No, I was watching the show. It's a great show so far. By the way, I've been on the Patreon uh, <clears throat> once a month, pay a little bit to uh, Payday Report. He's I've been the- doing that for about a year now. I, I don't it's, want to embarrass him because, you know, you he's can't. He's a hero. He's he, a hero, he is, man. He's a hero. I mean, and then I then you find out about where he went to journalism school. And I didn't know that. That's pretty, pretty wild. That was great. And, 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 and speaks fluent Portuguese. And uh, that, that was better than I thought it was going to be. They say, don't meet your heroes. But uh, he was he, he was having a party tonight. That yeah, it's deal? his one thousandth article. Oh wow! And he that's that was great of him to uh, pull away from that. Yeah, that's special. So let me just ask my listeners, wherever you're hearing this, check out Payday Report. Paydayreport.com. He is the real deal. You know, like he's a once in a generation guy. They don't come. They don't make people like this. Contribute to their Patreon, and then you get a little, you get a little news blast every day. Not yeah. every day. I think it's. I'm not. I'm not sure. It comes a lot though. Yeah. There's a lot of news, and it's pretty cool. Yeah. I think I'm gonna do a soft sell because I think people heard his voice, and there's nothing I can add to his authenticity. So if. If you have five dollars, you will feel better giving it to paydayreport.com. He's making the world better. There's stuff you'll learn there that is never mentioned anywhere on New York Times. Even, you know, it's he's plugged into a whole nother um, whole nother uh, level of stuff about, well, just about wor- workers issues. Right. Uh, How you doing, David? I'm doing really good now that you're here. Um, the uh, I apologize to Lenore, and uh, I'm sorry. I didn't. There were two questions I didn't get to. I, I you know, uh, I apologize, but th- there were I I effed up big time. Uh, I apologize to Neil, Tim, Lenore. Uh, not Tom, briefs or boxers. That's what MTV, Bill Clinton. Uh, okay. Uh, I didn't, Nancy. Yeah. It's I, time right now. Yeah. Okay. For the David Feldman show. He's going to apologize <laughs> for screwing it up. Well, he you didn't know. mean to do it, but he couldn't help himself. It's kind of, yeah. what, what's happening is. Uh, I'm back in the groove of doing the show in front of a virtual studio audience again. Yeah, we, we took yeah, some time that's... took some time off, a little exhaustion, and I think doing it on Friday nights is turning out to be a, a great way for me to end the week. And I know we have some people here uh, in the virtual studio audience who I want to talk to. So if you stick around, I want to hear what Chloe wants to tell me. And I, uh, there are some other people here. So, uh, but Mike Steinell is the author of Charlie Parker, Saving Charlie Parker, a, a novel. And you are a professor of jazz. Retired. Yeah, but you teach, certainly teach on this show. You've been doing some live performing. Yeah, it's been going really well. We had th- three gigs in the last <clears throat> two weeks. So, uh, that's been fun. Now I've got some time off. We're doing a big gig at uh, the AF of M, American Federation of Musicians. Um, For Mr. Hare. Yeah, we're doing their international conference. We're playing a set on uh, Sunday, June 25th. 
And that should be really remarkable. Great audience because it's all, you know, it's all music people. So it's terrific. We've done that twice before. And and uh, Ray's been really nice to invite us back. Ray Hare. Ray Hare's been a guest on this show. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you say you're retired. Uh, if this is what retirement looks like, I've never, I mean, you stopped teaching, but you're not retired. I keep busy. <laughs> Do you, I wrote you, I redid a song for you. To, did you get it? Oh, I, I, this has been a crazy day. What, what was the song that you redid? Uh, I redid the, the Feldman CV song. Oh, when did you but send it? But it's a it? New, new groove. When did you I send it? I sent it this afternoon. I can go s- send it again if you'd like. Uh, you may. May need to? You may need to. Yeah. How many emails do you get? Uh, you get a lot of, you must get a lot of emails. Uh, not nice ones. That's one of the. Okay, let me, I'm going to go send it. I'm going to go send it real quick. You vamp for time. Okay, well, I'll check in with Chloe. Let me check in. Chloe, are you still here? Chloe. Yes, I'm here. Give us an update. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. What is the name of your blog? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. It's Chloe Humbert. And um, yeah, it's on Substack. And I put a link in the chat and I have a letter writing guide. And right now I'm, you know, you brought up uh, the wastewater was how they found out about the polio in New York. And right now there's question of whether that's going to be continued funding so um, a lot of uh, municipalities are kind of leaving wa- like they're leaving money on the table for this. And like there's there's still funding for wastewater monitoring, not just for covid, but also, you know, for other things like polio and other other um, viruses. And I think they do um drugs too and there's some other things and um i'm promoting a letter campaign to fund that infrastructure and keep it funded and and hopefully promote it more so So it would be really helpful if everybody um you know wrote the representatives and i have uh an action network link i'll put in the chat it's actionnetwork.org slash letters slash wastewater data and uh I, it's important to speak up about this now because the funding will be in jeopardy if it's not being used. Right. So we're going back to the the roots of office hours. And one of the first things we used to do is organize and had it. We were union centric and uh, we wanted people to write letters. If they follow you on Substack, you will not give copy and paste letters, but ideas for what to write. Is that correct? Yeah, some of them are copy and paste. Some of them are forms and some of them, you know, are other people's campaigns that I find that you can use. But yeah, some of them are stuff that you can copy and paste or edit, you know, for yourself or just an, you know, an idea of what you should be writing about, which, you know, really, um, my advice is, is that anything that you're going to like complain about on social media or to your friends or in a forum, if it's something that's actionable by policy, you know, think to just, you know, bookmark your congressman's contact web page and, you know, let him know, let him mm-hmm. or her know. And, you know, that could be your state rep or, you know, your governor, or whoever, you know, makes sense or all of them, some issues. So, uh, yeah. Great. Thank you, Chloe. Next week, uh, what if you if you can make it next week, send me an email beforehand of what uh, topic uh, we should be uh, writing on. I'm a little okay. I'm a little behind uh, this this week. We all are. Everybody's overwhelmed. Thank you. And, and everybody should read Chloe's Substack, please. Thank you. Uh, all right. Davey Mammel, are you on strike? Are you a are you a federal employee? OK. Uh, the song. Did I it did, come up? Yeah. I don't know if I can play it because I'm using I'm just trying to let me just think here for a second. Oh, you're breaking my heart, David. I know. Uh, I worked really hard on that. Hang on. I'm sorry. Can you hear 
Let me see if you can hear this. Can you hear this? No. You can't hear it. No. You don't hear that? I hear nothing. Uh, damn it. Um, last, let me just try one more thing. No, I don't want to update. Can you hear this? Still. Oh, something happened there. Can you hear that? It's just... Oh, okay. So we can do it. Hang on for one second. Um, but it was just, just a bunch of noise. I know. How about this? There it is. Just let it fly. Does, okay, well, I'll give it a proper introduction. I just want to make... And it, it sounded okay. I don't know yeah. how I did that. Maybe a little more volume, but that's fine. Okay. I don't know how I did that. I, that was just pure <laughs> luck. So thank you. What, so what did you write? Well, you remember you, you said two lines from um, past discussions and that made me uh, think of writing a song. You said, I pumped gas in Sausalito. Yes. And that you were talking about jobs you had, and you said you were a, an usher at a cockfight. <laughs> yes, that's true. And that, that's all I needed. And I was off and running out. And I did a kind of a bluesy thing. And then I, this is more of a groove thing. And um, I, like the, I like the track. So, uh, okay. And I got some, I put background vocals on it and everything. All right. Let's... Got, got a little trumpet. Yeah. So this is, it's called Feldman CV. The Feldman CV. Curriculum Vitae. <laughs> okay. I never knew how to say that. Vita? Vitae? It's I, I guess so. Yeah. A-A-E? Vitae. Yeah. New music. New old music. It's, it's, it's a redo. A redux. A redo. A redux. A redux. Uh, Mike Steinel, Professor Mike Steinel. In Sausalito, I sold a fat man a burrito. I wrestled a big black bear. I sold my body on Times Square. I've been up, I've been down, I've been around. In Vegas, I dealt AC Ducey. While I listened to some Debussy I watched a lot of I Love Lucy I once looked a little like Gary Busey I've been up, I've been down I've been around up and down. I sliced pickles in the Yucatan I was Dennis Miller's wingman I was an usher at a cockfight I had a fling with Walter Cronkite So I've been up, I've been down I've been around While I listened to some smooth jazz I told some jokes at Santa Rita While I memorized Lolita Cause I've been up, I've been down And I've been around I worked at the Mustang Ranch Bordello Covering my body with apricot jello I recorded some raunchy YouTubes While I tried to hide my man boobs I've been up, I've been down I've been around
Mike Steinel is a jazz trumpeter, pianist, composer, arranger, and an internationally recognized jazz educator. He is the author of the highly acclaimed Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble and Building a Jazz Vocabulary. He has a new book out, Saving Charlie Parker, a novel. And Professor Marianne Cummings said, you never get writer's block. You're fearless. Well, I don't know if I'm fearless, but I'm just dumb enough to keep going. Yeah, that's that's the <laughs> answer. Yeah, <laughs> that's the answer. You know, I, was, I had a, I did a podcast today. A former student of mine has a really lovely podcast about artistry and stuff. Uh, her name is Emily Merrill, and her podcast is um, Artifice, which I thought was a it's great name. Yeah, Artifice. You know yeah. about the artifice, and um, we were we've been talking about all things creative and and. Uh, she had a lot of questions, but uh, no, I do get, I do, I didn't, I do get writer's block. By the way, I'm working on the, the new novel, Murder at Birdland. I read a little bit a couple of weeks ago to you, and uh, I've got another little excerpt if you want to yes, hear it. Yes, of course. But I've changed one thing. Um, it's time travel, but I've decided to have the person travel from 2001, November of 2001, to um, November of 1949. So he's going to be a person that's about 50 years old and he's going to fall in love with the 28 something in, uh, and he's a virgin. 19- yeah. He's a virgin. Yeah. We talked about that. Well, I don't know. I could, I could, I could make up a backstory. I think it's, I like I the idea it, of a virgin time traveling. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I, it, I had to put, I was just trying to decide where to put it, what time, because originally I had it 2019 going back 70 years and, and the guy was going to be 69. But then I thought, then nah, that's, that's a little old to be time traveling. And then I picked, I picked 2001, November of 2001. Can you imagine what had just happened? Refresh my memory. <laughs> Let's see, 2001. Let's see. Don't. Uh, sorry, I just. <laughs> so, <laughs> actually, that helped me, like, because then I could go back and, uh, you know, get some a reference. Because I remember that fall. That was still a pretty well, scary well, well, So fall. he 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 decides to time travel from November of two thousand and one. Right. That's when he what the premise why, is. Why doesn't he go back to like 1989 and tell the, our government not to fund the Mujahideen? I mean, there you go. See, now there's another, you, that's the one you can write. That's what I would he, do. This character finds out on his name is Martin Spencer, and he finds out at at um, after his father's funeral that the person who was that he just buried was not his biological father, that his biological father was a jazz man who um, was murdered in New York in uh, November 8th, 1949. And his mother has these photos of him that were sent to her from a a nightclub. And what got me started on this was um, a book called Sitting In, which is a great book. And all it is is photos from the 30s and 40s of people in nightclubs, you know, because they had those those, uh, souvenir photographers, you know, walking around. And... uh, and so that he has this photo and he can time travel with the photo. You want, you want me to read some? Yes, please. Of course. Okay. So he's found out, just to set it up, he's, he's found out that his uh, real father was a jazz musician murdered. And uh, anyway, so now he's trying to figure out what to do. For years, Martin had sought out those who shared his affliction. That is his issue with photographs. Something he'd lived with his whole life. Some practitioners called it a phobia, scopophobia. Others called it camera phobia. But Martin never felt that those labels described his issues. It was only when he met Thomas Gaylord that he felt he had a kindred spirit. For Thomas Gaylord, photographs were hot and could burn. Martin had experienced the same thing. Thomas Gaylord had described the buzzing sounds he heard and felt Martin had experienced those as well. But Thomas Gaylord had also talked of loops, what might be called time loops. Martin could almost recite word for word Thomas Gaylord's description of the incident at the photo booth at Fairyland Park. 
Thomas Gaylord is his patient. My, my character is a clinical psychologist. These are Thomas Gaylord's words. He threw the strip of photos at me, yelled corn dogs, and they both took off running for the food court. The strip hit me on the chest and I swatted at it with my hand. It burned. I watched them run away and I picked up the photo. I tried to be careful. That's when the buzzing started really loud. There was a vibration that moved from my feet up through my body. It hurt. I felt paralyzed. When the vibration got to my head, I fell down. Then the buzzing stopped all of a sudden. Complete silence. That's when I heard Brian and Mike in the phone booth singing. Tommy's scared of pictures. Tommy's scared of pictures. Then everything that happened before happened again. Led by some intuitive impulse, Martin stood up and walked to the door of Robert's study. That's his father. He pushed the door open and walked to the desk. There were photos on the desktop and Martin felt the heat of them. He had to lean back as he opened each of the drawers, trying to find the thing for which he was searching. Robert's Polaroid camera. It was called the Swinger. Robert, always a man who had enjoyed the latest trendy thing, had given himself a Polaroid camera for Christmas in 1966. Growing up, Martin would wince each time the flash went off and made every effort to avoid touching the photos. He felt their heat. He found the camera in the bottom of the left drawer. He studied it and carefully touched it. It was cool, not hot. He assumed it would have been hot had it contained an exposed print. He held it in his hands, trying to remember exactly how it worked. He had seen Robert use it many times, usually from a distance. He felt the side and found the tab that would be used to extract the print. Wow, could it still have film in it from the 70s? Will it still work? By the time he reached the sofa in the living room, he had worked out the plan. He stood in front of the sofa, put the camera to his face, and looked at the clock on the mantel through the viewfinder. Wait, he thought. The room's too dark. Need more light. He quickly turned on all the lights in the room, then walked to the windows that faced the street. He opened the blinds fully and the light streamed in. Returning to the spot in front of the sofa, he aimed the camera at the clock, which now read 1010. He pushed the red button that activated the shutter. The camera made a loud noise and his body jerked as if it'd been shocked. He staggered backward, but did not fall. The camera still in his hand now felt hot. He threw it down and moved away from it. He composed himself, took a breath, and tried to remember what to do next. Pull the tab. That's right. Pull the tab. Then remove the membrane from the back. He'd seen Robert do it and remembered his amazement the first time as he watched the image on the print appear. Dimly at first, then gradually becoming sharper and brighter. Come here, kids, Robert would say. Look at this. Isn't this amazing? Tamara and Winston crowded around the camera while Martin and Sylvia stood back a bit. Sylvia, his mother, was sensitive to Martin's fears since the Varenhorse incident. Martin extracted the film as he remembered, then peeled the membrane off the back. It was hot to the touch. He set the photo on the coffee table and waited. Will it work? This film's got to be almost ancient. It did work. Gradually, the image appeared, showing the mantle clock at 1010. The next step Martin faced with no small amount of trepidation. He would stand and hold the photo with his fingers on the image. It would be hot. He anticipated that he would feel or hear the buzzing or the vibrations as Thomas Gaylord had. And then, then, well, he was not sure of what then might happen. Martin stood holding the photo by the edges and moved to the spot where he had pushed the shutter. The sound began at first, a buzzing. Then he felt a slight vibration on the soles of his shoes. He was about to place the fingers on the image when he heard the sound of the truck coming down Elm Street. He turned his head just as it passed. With the blinds wide open, he had a good view. On the driver's side were painted the words, Hayes Construction. He turned back and looked at the clock on the mantel. It now read 1015. He held the photo by its edges. He was apprehensive but determined. He drew a breath and placed the fingers of his right hand directly on the image. It was only warm at first then hot, then very hot. He closed his eyes. It was painful. The buzzing grew louder. Then the vibrations began, first at the soles of his feet as if the floor was moving. The sound was something felt as much as heard, a low buzz, a humming sort of sound, slowly rising in pitch, like being inside an insect the size of a horse. He closed his eyes tighter as the feeling moved up his body, up through his legs, then through his torso, 
then to his shoulders and finally to his head. It was paralyzing. The sound was deafening. It hurt. His shoulders lifted up and the muscles on his neck tightened and went into spasm. All at once, everything seemed to exit his body out of the top of his head. Then complete silence, a complete and utter silence, just as Thomas Gaylord had described. In a way, the silence was almost as much of a shock to the system as the vibrations had been. He opened his eyes and tried to focus. It was hard. When he could see clearly, he looked around the room and realized that he had fallen back on the sofa. He looked at the clock on the mantel, which now read 1010. Son of a bitch, Martin said quietly. It worked. It worked. It worked. Or did it? There was no one to answer his question, but there needn't have been. Martin knew what had happened. He had looped back just as Thomas Gaylord had described. He sat staring at the clock, thinking and waiting. When the clock read 1014, he looked toward the front of the house. He heard the sound of the truck, and within seconds, it passed. On the driver's side door were painted the words, Hayes Construction. He looked back at the clock, which now read 1015. Where's the first truck, he thought. Or maybe, when is the first truck? He remembered what Thomas Gaylord had said. Time is confusing, doctor. Exciting. Now, what do you get by reading that out loud as a writer? And do you read everything out loud? Well, I, I, everything I've done, I've turned into an audio book. So, yes. Mm -hmm. And... As I read it, I edit it too. I've already, I, I, just as we did that, I, well, I was preparing earlier and I made some notes, you know, and by reading it out loud, you get a sense for the flow. I think making the audio book is a big part of the editing to make it, it's like music. I was talking to yeah, this. Yeah, let me uh, ask you about music. Uh, put, put a pin in that. For, are there, do you remember what you were going to say? Because I, I, yeah. Are yeah. there people who can write music without having to play it? They can hear it. They just see the notes. Well, I, I, I can do that. So you could write a song without an instrument and just read the, cl the clef and know what it sounds like? You can hear it in your head. Wow. If it's, if it's really complicated, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a melody for sure, if it's a harmony and a melody, yeah, pretty much. Um, if it's contrapuntal, like a lot of things going on, I, that's more like math. That, I mean, that somebody I could, like Quincy Jones, he can do an arrangement. Well, you know, Beethoven wrote most of his symphonies toned totally deaf. Right. But he had, he had, uh, um, yeah, you could, you, you could audiate in your head. You can do it. You do it with, can't you imagine a song that you know really well and, and hear it in your head? Every, we all do that. That's why we sing when we're not, when we're by ourselves. You go around, you whistle, you know. So that just sounds in there. Yeah, but I just can't imagine somebody creating music or arrangements and knowing what it's going to sound like just because they're working off a, a, a pencil and a piece of paper. I mean, that's cool. Well, I, I, I can do that. I know that if I'm, I'm going to have, I really kind of need to hear it to check it. And a lot of times just by, you know, like, just by experimenting, I would probably not come up with that. I can you, tell human, you, humans are pretty remarkable when you they, think. We, of yeah, we are. But you know, so, play, so lots of times I find stuff by my fingers find something new, you know, mm -hmm. or I play a line, and and right. it's really different. Um, I'll often write something on the piano, and then move it to the trumpet. And I go, no, it doesn't work on the trumpet so well. I need to change this note, you know. Okay, so I asked you to pin something. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that writing a paragraph or a story is very much like taking a solo. There's amount of, you know, there's pacing, there's um, avoiding repetition, there's the sentence link thing. That's like musical phrases. There's high points and, you know, um, there's words of emphasis, just like there's not every word in a melody, not every note in a melody is important. Not every word in a sentence is important. And uh, do you worry you know, the, that if you read something, if you read something out loud, do you worry that you're putting mustard on it and that the reader won't read the mustard? Yes, I do. That's why I like audio books. You know, that's why uh, an audio book from a really good reader is 
is uh, really a great way to to enjoy a book. Um, and and some readers are better than others, you know. Um, not I I was so disappointed with. Um, I got a. I thought I should know some something about Joan Didion. And um, who played Annie Hall? Uh, 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 Diane Keaton. Yeah, Diane Keaton reads it. And I'm sorry, I love Diane Keaton, but it's not a good reading. Yeah, I love it's Joan Didion. Flat. Yeah, I, you know, I thought I should just read this. I don't, you know, because. She's um, a great writer, great essays. Yes. Um, but, but I'm, you know, that, um, so that's an example of, you know, how I would have read it would be maybe different than hers was so flat. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, it would be like a solo with no inflection, you know, whereas somebody like Anton Lester, you know, that character, that um, actor, he does tale of two cities and he does like 20 different voices. Really? I, I, oh, I, unbelievable. I, I, I suspect Diane Keaton felt that Joan Didion's words speak for themselves. And I'm an actress. So don't over, don't, don't, don't get in the way. Don't yeah. eclipse. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, less is more, she probably thought. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, that's that, but that's a really good point. And as I was reading that, I thought, well, you know, someone just reading this because I, I pick up the pace. Like I wanted to get the sense of like that, that experiment that he does with the photos of the, the pain and everything, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, now, did, th go, there was a time with Polaroids when I was a kid. Hey, they still make them, by the way. They still make them, but you had to be rich to use them liberally. They're, they were only for special occasions, right? And it felt like they would never go out. I, there was a period where I remember thinking, well, Polaroids, this is the future. This is like as good as it gets. They have now... Uh, Fuji makes one that's it's digital, but then it's Polaroids. It prints them at like you, you take a picture and if you like it, then you hit the print and it prints it. If mm. you don't like it, you take another one. So it isn't like, I mean, you know, with the Polaroids, you, you, what did you have like 12 exposures in a pack, you know, and they, you, they were expensive. And that film is very expensive. You can still get the film for, Hey, here's a question. The actual camera that I'm thinking he's going to, I I, I have them my, in my mother's house. We have my sister's going through stuff. We have Polaroid cameras. Do you have the Swinger? The uh, Polaroid no. Swinger, the I white one, the, the big white one. I remember they brought the Swinger back when I was doing comedy. In well, they also have the big Swinger. That's still you can still get film for the big Swinger. But I thought you know the big Swinger that has like sexual kind of connotations uh, they, <laughs> he's a yeah, big swinger they, they were giving out uh, polaroid cameras at the toronto comedy festival like in i don't know 20 years ago and old polaroids or new ones uh no, new polaroid cameras they're like giving them out giving yeah them i think they were swingers i think they were called swingers yeah well that's the old that's the old model you can't get the you could you can't get film for the swinger it's just a it's a it's like something for the museum now, but you can get film. Fuji makes film for the big swinger and then Fuji makes their own. There's an, any number of when he travels back to New York, he has to take a smaller camera. He takes a Fuji so he can go. This guy can go wherever the photo has been taken. If he finds a spot where it's been taken and and he can travel to that time. So he has to have a way back, though. So he has to travel with. He goes to New York and he takes a picture of his hotel so that when when he when he wants to, he can go back to 2001 and fly right. home. But uh, before you go, he, what are you what are you reading for pleasure? I'm reading. Oh, uh, I read the, I, the Dylan book about. Have you read this? Where he which, take, which one? The philosophy of pop music. I don't know what the title yeah, is. Yeah, I, I, I listened to that and I, I, I read it and it's great. It's a great read. Yeah. I listened to the audio book and I did not enjoy it. Does he, is he reading it? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Um, the setup, the setup is um, by other actors like Jeff 
Bridges does one. I can't remember. Part of each chapter is done by somebody famous, and then the rest of it is done by him. Because, and it's very similar to his introductions he did uh, on the Theme Time Radio Hour. Did you ever listen to that? No, but I figured as much. Yeah. I think they might have mined those and and turned it into, you know, a novel. But here's the thing. There's no secrets about songwriting. It's more like background on he picks these hundred songs or whatever. And then there's background on the artists. And there's a lot of interesting stuff about the artists. Right. There's a new you book know, about uh, Steely Dan that's coming out. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I've been reading um, what's their book called what's Writing their... Well. It's a fantastic book. It's an old book. Writing Well? Who wrote it? Yeah. You would ask me that. Um, right. The name escapes me, but um, there was a an audio book called Kill Your da Darlings, which was all about, it was kind of a, like an appraisal of a bunch of different books on writing. And the guy really um, loved this one book and he quoted it a lot. And so I just finally got it, you know, and you got it used. It's, it's been out of print for a while. Okay. There's tremendous stuff. They're like about nouns, you know, and right. Um, and abstractions. He has this whole thing on abstractions. He said uh, they're, they're, they're weak. An abstraction is weak, like love. You say love, you know, that could be, that could be 25, 50 different kinds of things. And then he says, when you add like a modifier, like intense love, it makes it you have a weak modifier and a weak abstraction. Right. He says it's better to to explain something like that, like a, an emotion or an attitude, an abstraction. It's better to explain it through metaphor and analogy. Hmm. Like, yeah, metaphor and analogy is a stronger way to go. And that's just one little snippet. And there's tons of stuff on verbs and uh, and also how to write dialogue. He has some really interesting uh, stuff to say on how to write dialogue, which is a lot of my book is dialogue. Great. But um, Mike Steinell, go to Mike dot com and buy Saving Charlie Parker, a novel. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, I, I uh, the sound the, the, I hope you can uh, maybe uh, Pump up slip that song in. When yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. Pop it in there. Yeah. Hey, man, show's been great. Great. Thank you. I love you, buddy. Letter from Birmingham Jail. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's so funny. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>